So today we're going to be talking about seven reasons I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And ironically, they come from the passage that talk about his burial, not his resurrection. Welcome to People of the Free Gift, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. And we're so glad that you joined us. And uh, so let's go ahead and jump into the passage. But before we do, if you're new here to this channel, go ahead and hit this watermark anytime during the video and subscribe to this channel. We, re we do teaching through the Bible at least once a week and probably a lot more coming up in the future. Lots of exciting things that um, I'll be announcing in the near future. So hit that subscribe button if you like this kind of content. And uh, so, welcome, and we're going to be in all four Gospels, a little bit in each today. And uh, so, uh, let's go ahead and turn there. And so, all right, sorry, just little technical difficulties. There we go. Okay, so... Matthew or Mark 15 42 when evening came because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath Joseph of Arimathea city of the Jews which was a rich man an honorable counselor he was a good man and just he had not consented to the council indeed of the Sanhedrin and he waited for the kingdom of God he was himself a disciple but secretly for fear of the Jews he came and went into uh, went in boldly unto Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. And so this is Exhibit A. Uh, we're going to go through all the different exhibits here, uh, but this is the first one, and it's a rather simple one, but the specific mentions in this passage of Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and Pontius Pilate speak volumes. And we miss those kind of things as evidence for a particular thing happening because uh, it's just not how we're trained to think. But think about this. If you just think in terms of if you were making up the account of the resurrection of Jesus, would you go out of your way to name specific people that play key integral roles in the story? And would you in include them in your story if, in fact, they were not actually part of the story? So let me give you an example. Uh, the, the three examples here. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were both Pharisees. They were both part of the whole council that made the decision to put Jesus to death. But it says very specifically that uh, Joseph of Arimathea had left that council or he did not agree to the decision. And so what came first? Did Joseph leave um, before they made the decision or when they made the decision? Um, and so that's uh, just for you to discuss in, in the comments down below. What do you think uh, happened there? And so going on a little bit more, uh, Joseph... Uh, they says very specific things about him that, you know, he was a rich man, he was an honorable man, good and just, and uh, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he was himself a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of fear of the Jews. And it turns out Nicodemus was in that same boat. You remember Nicodemus, he's our second person here. He came to Jesus in John chapter 3 at night. And uh, he met with Jesus <coughs> to talk about the miracles that he was doing. And he says, you know, we know that uh, there must be something to this because nobody could do the things you're doing unless God was with him. And that was a particular belief of theirs, by the way. That's not necessarily true. But um, he, and then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, a man must be born again or 
or he cannot see the kingdom of God. So they have this whole conversation about what it means to be born again. Nicodemus walks away from that conversation. You don't necessarily hear much from him again, but secretly um, he was watching and keeping an eye on Jesus. And who knows if he didn't have other encounters with him throughout the gospels, or he was present for different uh, various events. And he probably was, being that he was one of the Pharisees, Joseph and Nick Nicodemus. Um, I've heard some people refer to Joe and Nick, you know, save the day. Uh, but uh, Joseph and Nicodemus were both probably comrades here because uh, at some point maybe they kind of sensed that the other one was sympathetic to the things that they were starting to believe and so then uh, maybe they kind of were in cahoots a little bit and maybe discussed some things on the side maybe not maybe both of them were just afraid to tell anybody but then at this key moment both of them step up in very pivotal ways joseph is the one who it, we wouldn't have a conversation about an empty tomb if it wasn't for Joseph of Arimathea. Most of the time, what happened to people who were crucified is that they were either left on the cross just to be eaten by wild animals, or they would just be buried in a very common grave. And if that would, would have been the case, then um, not only would it not fulfill prophecy, which is what we're going to get to later, but it also would have made it impossible to know whether or not there was, an, in fact, an empty tomb. And that becomes one of the three key historical uh, agreements that even secular historians say that the tomb was empty. And uh, that's one of the three key pieces of evidence that secular historians uh, believe. Now, they don't necessarily believe Jesus rose from the dead, but they do believe that the tomb was empty. And so Joseph plays that key pivotal role. He goes to Pontius Pilate and boldly and asked him for the body specifically. And so Nicodemus, the role he plays is he funds uh, the other part of it, and that's the burial process. Now, in the book of Leviticus and other places in the Old Testament law, it gives very specific um, instructions on how a person was to be buried. And there was a whole anointing process, and there was a whole ritual that went along with that if they were going to have an honorable burial. And so Joseph and Nicodemus are providing that honorable burial for somebody who, according to their own Jewish law, it says, cursed is anybody who hung on a tree. And Jesus, of course, was bearing the curse of the, our sin at that moment. So Joseph funds the tomb. It was his own family tomb, as we're going to learn. And it happened to be located in a very strategic place for this particular account. And that was in the same garden. It was it located in the garden that was associated with the place of the crucifixion. That would be Calvary or Golgotha, depending on the language you were using. So those are our first two guys. But then the third is one we've been talking about for a few weeks now, and that's Pontius Pilate. Now, it used to be something that was a ridicule uh, when you mentioned Pontius Pilate because at the time, uh, you know, several years back now, but there was no evidence for Pontius Pilate. And so people would mock and say that Pont Pilate didn't exist and this is all fairy tale and it's all made up. And then and they say every time a shovel goes in the ground, a skeptic is silenced. And so they found one day a, a chair, uh, like in cement, uh, it was kind of like a, a, a throne, so to speak, not a throne, but like a, a ruling seat. And etched in that was the inscription that uh, referred to Pontius Pilate. And so indeed he is a key historical figure. And you would expect him to be, uh, like I said, the disciples would not be likely to make up such a character. Neither Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, or Pontius Pilate are likely to be made up, and they all play very key, pivotal roles in the whole crucifixion and resurrection story of Jesus. So that is Exhibit A. Exhibit B, Jesus really died. Let's go Mark 15, 44, and Pilate marveled. 
if he were already dead. And calling unto the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for a while. And when he knew it of the centurion, Pilate commanded the body to be delivered to Joseph. And so Pilate, when he hears the request, he's thinking, wow, is he really dead? Is he already dead? And uh, so he he um, checks with the centurion. He verifies, hey, has he been dead a while? Like, how did that happen? And uh, he's kind of curious. He's oh, he's very intrigued. And I, I've talked before about how I really believe that Pilate, I would not be surprised if he became a believer in Jesus Christ and if he, um, if I see him in heaven. And so uh, the second part here is that Jesus is dead. And that seems like it shouldn't be a piece of evidence or even an argument because he was crucified after having, you know, the crown of thorns, being beaten severely and it being scourged, all of it. Um, then crucifixion in and of itself was enough to kill somebody. But then uh, to verify it, the Roman soldier defied orders, didn't break his legs, and instead threw uh, his spear through his side, and out comes blood and water. And so we know exactly why Jesus died, what he died of. There, there, there's no swoon theory here. There's no possibility that Jesus revived from this. And even if the thing I never understood about the swoon theory is that if Jesus was supposed to have revived in the cool of the tomb and from the spices and whatever else, uh, how in the world would a guy who is that badly beaten up and damaged convince others that he had conquered death and that he's risen from the dead? How does that even happen? And so I've always thought that this was rather a ridiculous argument, but here's the facts. Jesus really died. Going on, exhibit C, he was buried with the rich, and that's a fulfillment of prophecy from Isaiah 53, written 700 years before Jesus was born. I've alluded several times as we've been going through the trial and the crucifixion process to Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Those two passages in and of themselves are absolutely amazing evidence, prophetic evidence of the inspiration of Scripture and the deity of Jesus Christ and the fact that he is the Messiah. He did die for our sins. I encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. But going on, Mark 15, 46, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And he bought fine linen and took them down and wrapped them in the clean linen cloth with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And the garden was Joseph's own sepulcher, which was hewn out of a rock. Nobody had ever been buried there. And so Joseph uh, was not just requesting the body of Jesus to give him a proper burial, but he planned on actually giving Jesus his own family tomb. And it was a rather nice one. Uh, like I said, a lot of times, you know, they would just be buried in the ground. And if you were crucified, you would just be thrown in a common grave and they wouldn't really care what happened to you. They wouldn't give you any kind of honorable, you know, funeral or anything. And yet, so Joseph, that is what he's bringing to the table and providing for him his own family tomb. And the fact that it is in the uh, rocks on, on a hillside in a garden, um, in, it, in and of itself, gives us some other pieces of evidence later on in the story. But what effectively happens here is that we talked about last week how Jesus was crucified between two thieves, but yet he's buried in a rich man's tomb. And Isaiah 53, what it says is that he will die with sinners, but he will be buried with the rich. Okay, And that's exactly what happens as the result of those two things, uh, that Jesus was in fact killed amongst sinners and between criminals, but he was buried with the rich. And that is a specific fulfillment of prophecy. I just want to say another thing about this uh, this tomb. 
Now, people argue about whether, you know, the garden tomb or the uh, classic, you know, like medieval site is the real uh, burial place of Jesus. But I have to say that the garden tomb has a lot of evidence for it. Uh, first of all, you know, the, the whole description that it has here has a lot going for it. But there was actually a commentary before they discovered the garden tomb read, written on the book of Leviticus. And I can't remember the name of the person who wrote it, but he actually described the garden tomb just from the specifications in the Old Testament law about a proper burial and a different prophecies that had to do with with and associated with uh, the Messiah's death. And so I just wanted to throw that out there and, and you can k do your own research and kind of discover that. But um, it, I think it's really significant. And whether we know specifically which tomb is the tomb of Jesus, they definitely knew. The, the, the disciples knew where he was buried. Joseph knew where he was buried. Nicodemus knew where he was buried. Pontius Pilate knew where he was buried. The religious leaders knew where he was buried. So you wouldn't be able to fool anybody just by going to the wrong tomb and trying to pretend like that was the tomb of Jesus. Um, somebody else would have clarified that uh, because they started preaching the message of the resurrection 50 days after he was crucified. That is, uh, that is extraordinary, and they did it in the very city in which it happened. Okay, So you wouldn't be able to fool anybody. Exhibit D, who moved the stone? The stone is... Like I said, the, the tomb of Joseph was in a rock-hewn cliff, okay? And so it's on the side, and so it had this huge opening, and then you would go down into the entrance where Jesus would have actually been laid after he was being buried. And there would have been room for a whole bunch of other people, but there's still nobody there to this day. Joseph truly gave his family tomb to Jesus, so Matthew or Mark 15, 46, there laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was near. He rolled a great stone into the door of the sepulchre and departed. And uh, I think it's Frank Morrison is his name. He wrote a book, and uh, he was out of Harvard, I believe, and he wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? Because in and of itself, this stone was a um, significant portion of the evidence of the resurrection. Okay, and we're going to get to furthermore, the idea that the disciples stole the body, um, and we're going to see later how Pilate actually put a Roman seal on that, uh, on that, on that stone. And so anybody who would have moved that stone at all would have broken that seal, which would have automatically been penalty of death for anybody who would have done that. And so there was a seal of the Roman Empire upon this stone, and this stone would have taken several men to be able to move. And that was the, the piece of evidence that got uh, Morrison's attention to the, amongst all these other things to the point in which he became a believer in Jesus Christ. And it is a very powerful piece of evidence. You have to uh, explain how it is that these guys were able to do this. Um, you know, one of the things when the women who are coming up very shortly, when they come to anoint him for burial, uh, the, the accounts in the, of the resurrection that we're going to talk about later, they say as they're walking there, they, they, we have this biases, but how in, how in the world... Are we going to move the stone? Who's going to move the stone? And they're having this whole conversation. When they get there, the stone's rolled away. They have an angel there, all that kind of stuff. Preview of things to come. So speaking of the women, exhibit E, criteria of embarrassment. Criteria of embarrassment, just so you know, is when uh, if you were making up a story, it's uh, elements in the story that would have been harmful to your cause, uh, meaning that it would have made your story less credible to most everybody. And this is probably the topper when it comes to that. And that is the whole concept that uh, they would have had women as the primary witnesses 
of the empty tomb, primary witnesses of the resurrection uh, of, re of Jesus Christ, of the, the resurrection appearances, all of that. Uh, women who are not even allowed to testify in court uh, as a valid witness. And so this is rather, um, it rather sticks out as evidence that these guys were not making this story up. Because all you see there is women. In fact, the guys are not even mentioned in this account anywhere. Um, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are really the only guys that you see anywhere in this whole account for quite a while. And they were enemies of Jesus that you would, again, you wouldn't make that up if you were trying to create this whole account of Jesus. So here's what it says, Luke 23, 54. And that day was the preparation, the Sabbath drew on, and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the Mary of jo the mother of Joseph, and that's one of the half-brothers of uh, Jesus, by the way. So this is Mary as a mother of Jesus, which came from Galilee, followed after. They beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. They sat over against the sepulcher where he was laid, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Okay, so they're dealing with the Sabbath here because it's Passover time, and after Passover comes the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then after the Feast of Unleavened Bread comes first fruits, which, by the way, Jesus was crucified on the Feast of Passover, and he rose on the Feast of First Fruits, which is just another piece of evidence that I didn't even count in this whole thing. But it's there. And so every time you have one of those high holy feast days, that would be another Sabbath, which is another day in which you're not supposed to do anything, which made it very, a very small window of time for the women to be able to go and um, do this anointing for his burial and do their part. <coughs> And so you have women who are going to the tomb with spices, and they're coming. And so all you have is women, 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 women. And uh, that is the criteria of embarrassment. There's no way in the world that the disciples would have invented women being the primary witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Exhibit F, prophecy of Jesus confirmed. Now, earlier we talked about Old Testament prophecies that were given by the Old Testament prophets. But here we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus himself actually said, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to rise again from the dead on the third day. Okay, And he said it several times in several different ways. And it seems like the only people who actually remember that he said that were his enemies. And that even speaks even more volumes. So let's go ahead and look. Matthew 27, 62, it says, Now the next day that followed the day after the, of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. So two things here, that Jesus said, I will rise again after three days. I will physically resurrect from the dead. It was understandable to the point that his own enemies heard it, understood it, and they believed that he was serious about it. Okay, so serious that, okay, think about this. What does it say about Jesus that even though he is dead due to crucifixion, that these guys, these religious leaders, are still concerned that they have not seen the end of Jesus. It makes me wonder why, when everything was said and done and all these things came to pass, why did they not reflect on this more? Except that they were hardened of heart and they were blind in their eyes. Okay? That's about the only way that you can express that and articulate that. And what, what was going on here is that these guys were so hardened, so blind, so prideful, and just didn't want to give up their power and authority and everything that they thought they had, that they were just blind and ignorant. And they actually intentionally make up a lie. And we're going to get to that later. But they go to Pilate. This is the Jewish leadership 
going to the Roman leadership. Now, remember before, they wouldn't even go inside of Pilate's quarters, okay, to talk to him when he was trying Jesus. It was a huge disrespect to him. But now that they need him, they have to humble themselves and they have to get in there and they have to talk to him. They make this request. We remember that this guy said, so that confirms that Jesus said it and it's being confirmed by his enemies, which then gives a confirmation later. And we're going to get into that into a second. Okay. So exhibit G, the empty tomb confirmed by Jesus' enemies. Matthew 27, 64, command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say unto the people, he is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. So when they're requesting a pilot, they say, hey, we remember this guy said he is going to rise again from the dead up to the third day. Now he has these followers. These followers are committed. They, they're, they're dedicated. And they might be crazy enough to try and steal the body. So what we need from you is that uh, the sepulcher be made sure until the third day. So after the third days, third day, uh, what he said is irrelevant. And even after, if it happens, he's already wrong, whatever. But uh, they might come at night and steal his body. So can we have a guard? Now, what this becomes, because of this request, uh, and this is, by the way, this is their story that they create, is that uh, the disciples came and stole the body. And that's not just something the Bible made up. That is something that's still recorded to this day in the Jewish Talmud, which is their authoritative writings and belief systems. It's one of the reasons why they believe or they, they have rejected Jesus as the Messiah, amongst other things. But they make up this story. They secure the guard. And so there's a guard there because of them. That's a ro trained Roman soldiers that are, if they let a prisoner go free that was even alive, they would be sentenced to death, okay? This was no light matter. They wouldn't take in this lightly. They wouldn't just let the disciples, you know, bribe them or talk them into it or sneak past them. So even if they got past the guards, then you had a seal on the tomb that if anybody broke that, they would be put to death. And if you managed to get past the guards and break the seal, you'd have to move the stone. And then you would have to get Jesus, you know, a grown man with all these ointments and spices and everything else out of the tomb, and then you would have to successfully hide the body in a place where nobody would ever be able to find it because it's never been produced. I think that is something to consider. Exhibit H, the Roman guard. So Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So there's the seal on the stone. There's the guards at the tomb. That's everything that they would have to go through if they were going to uh, get that. And so I, one thing I just want to throw in there, I've mentioned it before, but Pilate he says when they, they say this, he kind of, I think he has like a little smirk on his face. And I think he says, make it as sure as you can. I think Pilate, if he had made up his mind yet, I think he wanted to know. I think honestly, I think he wanted to just stack the deck and say, let's see what happens. If I hear back that this guy came out of his tomb and he's walking around town I will. <laughs> I, I, I would be very surprised if Pilate didn't end up believing after all of these things. Okay, so that's Exhibit H. 
And that concludes our evidence, seven pieces of evidence, seven reasons why I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And this didn't even include all of the other pieces of evidence that we're going to encounter as we get into the actual resurrection accounts. And then as you go into the book of Acts and the accounts of the early church, the changed lives of the apostles, um, all of these things. So, and even the resurrection appearances themselves and how many people that Jesus um, appeared to. And then you have even things like his own family converting and believing that he was God because he had risen again from the dead and appeared to them directly. And I'm speaking specifically about James and Jude. James becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church, and Jude wrote the book right before Revelation in the New Testament. Those are both half-brothers of Jesus. And so uh, that is what I have to say about that. Now let's just reflect a little bit. What piece of evidence spoke loudest to you and why? Is there any piece of evidence you don't understand? And maybe I'll throw it to there. You don't believe. Do you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead? I want to hear from you. I would love to talk with you more about this. What role does evidence have in your faith in Jesus Christ? And what role should evidence have in our faith? Do you think you would have the courage to do what Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea did? They gave up everything. Okay, they gave up status, they gave up power, they gave up position, they gave up uh, you know everything. And probably some of Joseph's wealth was associated with him being on the Sanhedrin there. <clears throat> and so, would you have the courage to do what Nicodemus and Joseph did? Why or why not? Why were the Jewish religious leaders who rejected Jesus the only people to remember Jesus' prophecy of the resurrection? Um, and I think, I, I don't have a good reason, answer for that, honestly. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Why, were the, uh, who, why do the apostles of Jesus appear to be absent in this passage while the women are very prominent? And would you be able to share this evidence with a friend? And what can I do to help? I really want to hear your thoughts and the comments down below on those things. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up. Share this video with others and help us grow this community and channel. I'd love to hear from you. I will reply to anybody who leaves a comment. And until next time, may his power be with you.